I have control issues. There's a particular subset of society with an irrational appreciation for control panels of all kinds. Many of you watching this video right now fall into this category. If you've ever looked at a recording studio console with lust in your eye, I'm talking about you. If you can't figure out just where in that societal subset you reside, or if you just want to see something that'll make you tingle in all the right places, do a YouTube search for Vegas mode, and you'll understand pretty fast where on the spectrum you reside. I've had a massive amount of questions regarding the control panels in power plants, so I'm taking the time today to do a deep dive and help you understand what every single knob, switch, button, meter, and light does here at Site 2. The panels at every place are pretty similar, but they're different enough to be interesting. Site 2, though, is hard mode. Not for something we have here, but for something we're missing. Site 2 doesn't have a frequency meter. So we have to do the entire phase one sync purely by sound, feel, and practice. So let's explore the whole board together and learn about each item in turn. You'll have a much deeper understanding of how a small scale hydro plant actually works by the time we're done. So the board is divided into two sections. The top half is metering, the bottom half is controls. The top left meter is our utility voltage meter. We operate at a nominal 2400 volts AC here, so our primary metering range is 0 to 3000. This meter is showing us the voltage on the lines that actually connect us to the national power grid. If there's a blackout outside, we'll see this crash to zero. Thankfully, that's a pretty rare, not as rare as I'd like, but a pretty rare event. The vast majority of the time, this meter never moves. If it does, it usually means something is really most sincerely wrong. For us, it's really nothing more than a go, no go meter. If it's sitting at about 2400 volts, we're good to go to the next step. And that's well over 99% of the time. If it's at zero, then we can't bring the plant online. Okay, yes, we can bring the plant online if it's at zero, but that's a black start condition. That gets really complicated and we need to do a lot of coordination with outside people. Our power plant has to work in partnership with the load of the grid in order to maintain frequency. If there's nothing for us to push against, things get really weird. But that's a way bigger story, so ask me about a black start sometime in the comments and we'll go down that rabbit hole. All things considered, this meter is rather pointless. If the grid goes down, the plant will trip out anyway. If we're online, we know that it's at 2400 volts. If I walk in the room and the lights are on, well, that meter is gonna be showing 2400 volts. If I walk in the room and the lights are off, that's gonna be at zero volts. So if this meter is showing anything other than zero or 2400 volts, it probably means we need to replace our potential transformers. Because if the grid voltage is off by more than just a few percent, it means something is very, very wrong. The good news is, that's not my problem. Cool bit of trivia though, the voltage and even the frequency of the power delivered to your house actually changes a little bit throughout the day. The delivery of electricity is very much a real-time operation and the grid is constantly flexing and shifting tiny amounts. All of this is happening instantly and everything is a giant house of cards and a perfect balance. When you turn your coffee pot on in the morning, every generator at every power plant connected to your section of the national power grid actually feels that and has to work a tiny bit harder. Because of this giant balancing act, the voltage to your house fluctuates tiny amounts. Most of the time you'll never notice it. But if you were to put a simple meter and a data logger on any wall outlet in your house, you would see the evolution of the incoming power. This gives a glimpse at the immense amount of largely invisible work being done by gigantic machines and thousands of people to keep your life working as normal. In the US, our frequency tolerance is plus or minus only five one hundredths of a cycle per second. Though in a lot of other countries, the frequency tolerance can be as big as a couple tenths. For voltage that you would measure at your house in a simple residential circuit, the official nominal voltage is 120 volts. But if you actually measure it, anywhere from 114 up to 126 is totally normal. This is a swing of plus or minus 5%. The official rules for this, in the US at least, are outlined in the ANSI standard C84.1. The middle meter in the top row is the one that gets the most people excited, which is funny because for the vast majority of the time, it's not doing anything at all. But for the two minutes a day that it's moving, it holds the absolute rapt attention of everyone in the plant. This meter and its pair of little lights is the synchroscope. Ours is an analog one because we're old school cool like that. This meter is showing our phase relation with the grid outside. In order to connect to the grid, we have to be perfectly matched in three things, voltage, frequency, and phase. In this plant, the synchroscope pulls double duty. During startup, it also shows us our frequency, kinda. 
it's not really designed for this, but it works well enough for now, and for now has been since 1993. Not for nothing, but in 1993, I looked like this. Maybe it's time for some upgrades, eh? I hope to be installing a frequency meter here, as well as a lot of other fun modern things in the near future. So much of what I'm talking about here today may be changing pretty soon. And yes, of course, you'll get to see it all happen. Once we get very close to being on frequency, this meter overcomes its inertia and starts swinging wildly. Once it's moving, you know exactly two things. You know that you're very close because it only starts spinning when you're within a cycle or two. And you know if you're a little fast or a little slow based on what direction it's spinning. The slower it's moving, the closer you are to your target speed and synchronization. Up on the top right, we have generator voltage. This is another one of those meters that only comes into play if something goes really most sincerely wrong. Most of the time, our generator is tied to the grid. That means that our voltage at the generator is the exact same voltage as that of the grid. It has to be. The wires are connected to each other. That's literally what grid tied means. But in the moments right before we tie to the grid is when this meter really serves its purpose. Its real job is to let us know that we're as closely matched as we possibly can be to the voltage of the grid so that when we tie in, it's as small of a shock to our system as possible. We could tie into the grid with a voltage way out like this, but such things are not healthy for generators. The generator voltage is a function of how fast we're spinning and how much energy we're pushing into the rotating coils of the exciter. We can spin at full speed and still not make any voltage at all if the exciter is turned off. We can spin slow enough to make only 40 hertz power and still be over voltage if we lean on the exciter. For us to be able to tie into the grid safely, everything must be in perfect balance. We have to be moving at exactly the right speed to make 60 hertz electricity. We have to have the exciter supplied just right so that we make 2400 volts on the generator outputs. And we have to be perfectly synchronized to the waveform out on the grid. Next up, we have this happy meter. This is our AC kilowatt meter. And at this plant, it goes all the way up to 600. The only time this generator is ever gonna see 600 kilowatts is if it gets struck by lightning. I think the highest I've ever seen it is maybe half that, and I consider 250 to be a most excellent day. Let's take a moment to understand what this meter is actually showing us. This meter reads in kilowatts. A kilowatt is 1,000 watts. In simple terms, a watt is the amount of electrical work done when one amp of current is flowing across one volt of potential difference. One kilowatt is equal to about 1.34 horsepower. One kilowatt is how much electricity this robot uses. A typical microwave uses about one to one and a half kilowatts. A kilowatt is roughly the amount of power the average house in America is using at this moment. Usually it's a little less than that. In the real world, given that some people live in a cardboard shack, some people live in an apartment, and some people live in a house with five people, two dogs, a whole bunch of robots, giant lasers, high voltage gear, and spend all their day rendering video, there's such a wide disparity between how much any given house uses, we always have to speak in averages. Now, with the average American home, given that our generator here is outputting around 200 kilowatts nominally, realistically, we're probably providing power to 200 to 250 homes at any given moment. But it's really hard to pin that down, and I've never as a scientist, been able to have a way to do it that I really liked. There's a lot of smart people that watch these videos and a lot of you guys work in power plants or in electrical power and distribution. I would love to know how you compute that for yourself. I'd love to know how many houses you think we're powering because if you can give me better numbers, I'd really like to know it. So teach me, hop in the comments below and let me know how many houses you would say that we're powering from our 250 kilowatt generator. So the current meter we're up to now is the current meter, our AC amp meter. This one ranges from zero to 150 amps here and it's a great time for me to give you something to think about. If we know that our generator voltage is this and we know that our output kilowatts is this and we know that volts times amps equals watts, then why doesn't our amps match up with all those other numbers? I'm just gonna let you think about that. Comment in, I'd love to see the fights that result from this one. The answer, and I'm going to call this now, you're both right. 
That brings us over to the next meter, and this is easily the most confusing for everyone. I'll be doing a comprehensive and incomprehensible deep dive on this in the future, but for now, let's see if we can break this down into a language that everyone can easily understand. Remember the synchroscope from up there? That meter is measuring the phase relationship of our voltage compared to the voltage out on the national power grid. The power factor meter is doing the same thing, but instead of phase relationship of voltage, this is measuring the phase relationship of current between our generator in here and the national power grid. The voltage on power lines, in America at least, is oscillating at 60 cycles per second. As the voltage swings in and out, the current moves with it. If all we had on the grid were tungsten light bulbs and resistive heaters, we'd be fine. But in the real world, we have massive amounts of induction from things like electric motors that are pulling the current out of sync in one direction. And we have capacitive loads from things like buried cables and a million household devices, like giant stereos with their big filter caps. And those are pulling that current out of sync in the other direction. Induction's pulling us one way, capacitance is pulling it the other way. Here, on the generation side of things, it's actually a lot simpler. Our power factor in relation to the grid is determined by the voltage we feed into the generator's exciter windings. It's critically important for us to deliver good, clean power, and a major part of that is making sure that our power factor is maintained as close as possible to 1.0. Anytime that needle isn't pointing straight up, we're making heat and wasting money. These two meters have been taking up space since long before I came to work here. And if you look inside, They're not even wired to anything. This is a common problem with old facilities. Generations of upgrades and tinkering or some idiot trying to fix something that they don't really understand. Sometimes that's me. This stuff often results in all manner of equipment being AIP'd, or as we call it, aped. When you see ape written on something or hear a tech say something about aped, it means abandoned in place, which is a fancy way of saying they couldn't be arsed with removing it. The odds on a piece of gear being aped is directly proportional to the scrap value that it's worth. Big, expensive transformers that are worth a couple bucks a pound in scrap copper, those don't get left sitting around. But little junk bits of plastic metering sitting inside a control cabinet that are gonna take a few minutes to get out, those will be there for decades. I'm pretty sure these meters used to display the headwater and tailwater level, and maybe someday I'll have a boring afternoon and see if I can bring them back into functionality because that could be a fun little blinking lights project. Despite those meters being bricked, we do absolutely still measure the headwater levels and the tailwater level. Only nowadays, instead of feeding to a couple meters on the panel where they get read every day by a guy and written in a log, they feed directly into the PLC where the computer reads them every five seconds. Big ugly here in the middle is the antique kilowatt meter. What am I saying? It's all antique. This is our internal kilowatt hour meter. This is used as an auditing tool. We generate electricity and sell it based on the kilowatt hour, which is a really stupid way to measure power, but don't even get me started. You remember the kilowatt meter from over here. If you generate one kilowatt for one hour, that equals one kilowatt hour. We get a few pennies for every kilowatt hour we generate. So this meter actually measures our paychecks. Well, kinda. There's another kilowatt hour meter outside that's read by the utility company. That's the meter that actually determines our paycheck. But things break and I have trust issues. So we keep this meter in here measuring the exact same thing and use it to check that both meters are operating properly. If there's ever a discrepancy, we know something's screwed up and then we go fixing things. And don't even get me started on why measuring things in kilowatt hours is the stupidest thing ever. But that's a story for another time. Moving down the control panel, we have this hour meter, which reads 40,837 and change. Given that it's measured 40,837 for as long as I've worked here, this tells us one of two very important things. Either that's how long it took for this meter to die in this application, or like the head and tail water meters, it's been aped. There's no power connected to it as far as I can tell, but I've never really dug into it. Maybe one of these days we'll tear it apart and see if we can bring it back to life. If nothing else, it'd be a fun, boring afternoon project. And that finishes up the meters section of our tour. In part two, we'll cover the knobs, buttons, and switches, and you'll get to learn what all the controls do. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I sincerely appreciate you, your time, and attention. I hope you found this stuff as interesting as I do, and maybe even learned something new today. Love it or hate it? Let me know what you think in the comments. 
Stay curious, keep asking questions, and keep exploring. It absolutely does get better. We'll see you next time.